For four years, the world fought against the Kaiser and his troops, a war to end war. Somewhere among those troops was an obscure Lance Corporal, Adolf Hitler, inconspicuous, avoiding the danger of the trenches, serving as a runner for the German staff. November the 11th, 1918, the armistice is signed. While the world rejoices, Hitler lies in hospital, staggered by the news of defeat. Around him already is the murmur of revolution. It gathers pace. The Kaiser flees to Holland. The German army is disbanded, and from the rabble of unemployed soldiers is formed the Reichswehr, an armed political body that Hitler joins. In 1919, the politicians of the world gather at the old palace of Versailles to plan for peace. The treaty they sign is designed to give peace to Europe, freedom to minorities, and they hope ultimate prosperity to the German masses. They have never heard of the Austrian who has risen from the DOS houses of Vienna, from painting and selling postcards, to the proud position of a spy for the Reichswehr. In Düsseldorf, industrial troubles break out. The big industrialists, men like Krupp, Tyson and Kierdorf plunge the people into poverty. Hitler sees his opportunity. He deserts the Reichswehr and forms a new party, the Nazis. With peaceful displays in Berlin, official Germany celebrates the formation of the Republic under President Hindenburg. Meanwhile, Hitler is attracting support to his Nazi party by pretending to adopt socialism. As the crisis deepens, representatives from all the provinces attend a Congress and pledge themselves to pull together. Meanwhile, Hitler tries his Munich beer cellar putsch. When that fails, he realizes he cannot make headway without powerful support. So he reverses his policy, forgets his pretense to socialism, and sells himself to the big industrialists, the very men who are throttling the German people. So, with the help of its powerful backers, when the new Reichstag is opened, the Nazis have secured seats. The first brown shirts, with their swastika armbands, stride arrogantly into the meeting. Hitler is growing in power as the big industrialists fall for his argument that their choice is between himself and communism, between the swaggering leadership of Goering or the revolution. Serious rioting breaks out. The Nazis are deliberately causing trouble to force the people of Germany to believe that there is a threat of violent communism in their midst, that only by supporting the Nazis can they avoid another revolution. The situation gets worse. Six million unemployed are starving. At Lausanne, the Allies discuss the situation in Germany. They fear a complete breakdown, a civil war, which will wreck the peace of Europe. The Allies fail to see that all their loans to Germany are being seized by Hitler and his backers. The Allies agree to cancel all reparations. It is too late. In Germany, the Reichswehr is still loyal to Hindenburg. Its display of strength scares Hitler. Again, he reverses his policy. He pretends to throw in his lot with the communists and deliberately provokes the great transport strike. His underhand tricks work. At last, the army offers him its support. In Geneva, the Allies make yet another effort to save Germany. The Disarmament Commission agrees to terms which put Germany on an equal footing with the rest of Europe. With every country disarmed, surely it will be possible to keep peace. But Hitler now has the army behind him. As the leader of the strongest party, he is called to Berlin by Hindenburg and asked to take office as Chancellor. But he isn't satisfied. He wants absolute power. He demands an election. On the eve of the elections, the Reichstag building goes up in flames. Hitler and his Nazis scream it is a communist plot. They rig up a fake trial. They find a half-crazy Dutch boy who is persuaded or tortured into confessing. Months later, the world is to learn that the Nazis themselves started the fire. But at the time of the election, the German people do not know this. They believe in the trial and all that the Nazis tell them that it is part of a communist plan for a bloody revolution in Germany. In a state of panic, the people vote for the Nazis. Little do they know what horror they are bringing upon themselves and upon the world. The curse of the swastika. The Nazis stage great parades to celebrate their overwhelming victory in the election. Thus, Hitler has at last succeeded in lying and tricking his way into power, making and breaking promises to everyone in turn, showing himself as a man without a shred of honor, decency or principle. In Germany, there begins the rule by force, the degradation of a nation, the loss of liberty and hope. Even the old German imperial flag is condemned. In future, the Nazi emblem shall fly alongside the old flag. Germany comes completely under the curse of the swastika. In Berlin's Opera House on the 23rd of March, the Reichstag meets. While Hitler poses as a man of peace, laying a wreath in memory of the men who died to put him in power, Nazi stormtroops force the Reichstag to pass a bill giving Hitler complete dictatorial powers. Britain still thinks of peace. On the 7th of June, the Four Power Pact is signed. Meanwhile in Germany, Hitler talks of the sacredness of treaties, swears that neither France nor Poland has anything to fear from him, that all he wants is peace. 
Yet the wheels of the German armament factories have already begun to turn. Openly they talk of peace. Secretly they build guns. On the 14th of October 1933, Germany leaves the League of Nations and the Disarmament Conference. Hitler claims that both have failed. In Poland, Marshal Pilsudski is the strong man reviewing his troops. With him, Hitler signs a treaty as a gesture of good faith. All differences between Germany and Poland to be settled by peaceful negotiation. Germany has no territorial claims in Europe. But almost at once, Hitler turns greedy eyes towards Austria. He embarks on a deliberate policy of provoking trouble there. While the Austrian army parades in Vienna, a voice on the German radio urges the troops to mutiny trying to provoke anti-communist civil war in Austria. The voice on the German radio is that of Halbricht, one of Hitler's lieutenants. Immediately, Britain, France and Italy join in warning Hitler. He is scared by the joint action against him. He flies to Venice to see Mussolini. By the side of the brilliantly uniformed Duce, Hitler cuts an almost insignificant figure as they ride together down the Grand Canal. Mussolini shows his guest the beauties of Venice while he talks of Italy's power. Hitler realizes that he must respect Austria and call off the Nazi terror. Hitler must have been so busy making promises he can hardly have noticed the beauties of Venice. Not for one moment does he intend to keep his promises. But for the time being, affairs at home distract Hitler's attention from Austria. It is obvious that Hindenburg is a sick man. The Nazi party leaders meet and elect his successor, Hitler. He prepares the way by getting rid of possible enemies in the famous blood purge of June 1934. Hundreds are murdered, including many of those who were closest to Hitler in the early days of the movement. Meanwhile, in Vienna, the chancellery is stormed by Austrian Nazis. Immediately, Italy moves up troops to the Austrian frontier, giving notice that she intends to keep her word guaranteeing Austrian independence. Hitler is caught unawares, so he deserts the Austrian Nazis. Dolphus, the chancellor of Austria, is dead, murdered in his own palace by the Nazis. As his murderers watched him bleed to death, they refuse his dying request for a priest to be called to administer the last sacraments. And Hindenburg is dead too, on the 2nd of August, 1934. There is no need for an election to his successor, for the Nazi cabinet has already chosen Hitler. In his first speech as Reich president, he makes a mockery of the old president's funeral. Hitler is now an all-powerful dictator. At the cadet school at Lichterfelde, the army now swears allegiance to him, to the man who has achieved power by lies, trickery, and the murder of hundreds, including his closest friends. That man the German army now swears to serve. The swastika now hangs like a horrible and barbaric curse over Germany. It is the symbol of ruthless murders, of the persecution of the Jews, of every form of gangsterdom and racketeering, of the destruction of anything that stands in Hitler's way. Everyone in Germany is under the curse, from child to old man. Workers are hammered into a dumb acceptance of it by the brutalities of the Gestapo and the concentration camp. A few escape as homeless refugees. Einstein, the greatest scientist of this age, is driven out penniless for the crime of being a Jew. The Jews are being sacrificed by Hitler to still unrest among the people. Once, the workers were told that the Nazis stood for them and socialism. Now they're getting restless and discontented under broken promises. The Nazis have a new tale, that the Jews are the capitalists to be wiped out. At the same time, the big industrialists are being told another story, that the Jews are the agitators and middlemen who grab all the profits. The people of Germany are still free to vote. They may choose between Hitler and the concentration camp. Elections are a mockery under the supervision of Gestapo agents. By force and terrorism, Hitler has obtained some semblance of unity in Germany. Now he looks beyond his boundaries. He raises the question of the Tsar, which is still under the mandate of the League of Nations. He claims that it must return to Germany. We want no one in the world. We must know that this people is a unbreakable block. Under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, the people of the Saar are to vote in January 1935 either to return to Germany or to remain under the League. 
Italian, British, Dutch and Swedish troops are sent into the Saar to keep order and prevent anything like a Nazi putsch, which would almost certainly provoke France into warlike action. In Britain, some people hope that the Tsar will vote for a return to Germany and against the League. Others believe that if the vote goes against Hitler, he will try to seize the Tsar by force and throw the whole of Europe into a state of war. But they vote for Hitler, all right, under the gentle persuasion of secret Nazi agents, and peace is saved at a price, the weakening of the League. Immediately, Hitler tells the diplomats that he has no further territorial claims. At the same time, he announces that Germany is building up an air force. He even makes a futile attempt to justify this by saying that he cannot give mutual assistance under the Locarno Pact without planes. Flandau, France, is alarmed by Hitler's action. France has been disarming and now finds herself in an inferior position to Germany. Flandau announces immediate steps to increase France's military strength. The arms race is on. War clouds gather again over Europe. Sir John Simon and Sir Eric Phipps fly to Berlin to try to find a peaceful solution. But they are cold-shouldered by Hitler, who is at Berchtesgaden. He refuses to see them, saying he has a bad cold. Two days later, Hitler returns to Berlin to announce that he has a plan to save the peace of Europe. He has no cold, but he has a peace plan. Conscription for Germany.